Uh, all right, well, I, we can kind of start talking about some of the stuff before we get into the, the meat of the webinar. Um, and the first one, you put this in here, which uh, I'm glad you put this in here because I, I think this is something we should be eating more of. So I don't know if we have enough people to even tell, like guess what this is yet. <laughs> I don't know if Some anyone people is uh, Yeah, it's, here? when you're the lead, you can't see chat at all. So I have no idea what people are saying. Right, I, I, nobody is, so oh, we have one person guessing. It's not, it's not what it is. <laughs> that's very close. What did <laughs> like, they say it oh, was? It was Guanabana. Mm, oh, that's an even more interesting Our guess. Sop, which is another, these are all like different words for similar fruits. Um, that's <laughs> entirely. So far, nobody has got it yet. I'm, I'd like to have chat side by side in my format and I'm having trouble getting it set up, but I will get it there. Mm, so far, yeah, no something native to North it America. is a native, it is native to North America. Yeah. If that's a hit hint that helps anybody. I think that does help. Like, I, Ooh, like, somebody got it. Yeah. So <laughs> it is a pawpaw. And the reason I wanted to feature pawpaw is one, because we are doing fall trends and it is one that has not been made into a huge thing for I'm sure a lot of operational reasons I am unaware of. But if you can solve those reasons, <laughs> it would probably be a, a very optimal fall item um, because it is native to the US. Um, it's more regional um, to certainly like if you look at those who have tried it, Southern consumers love it way, way more, which I think mm -hmm. is my next slide, but I don't, don't think it goes down as far as, <laughs> right now. Um, but I did filter among those who have tried it because um, the love it was just too low because nobody is familiar with it. But when you look at those who tried it, people uh, adore it because it is like, um, it has tropical flavors despite growing in non-tropical locations, which is mostly like, um, I'd said like anywhere, even like, um, what is it the level five or above like we could grow this yeah <laughs> it's actually there's can. some in michigan there, yeah like, there's it, it's, yeah they, it's like you can it's like the treat that happens in mm -hmm. late um hiking weather if you happen upon it and know what you're doing you get this delicious like banana vanilla flavored fruit so that is i have i had it in a smoothie anyway. one time and it was really good i think the thing is it's like it, it gets really mushy pretty easily and so i think that's like Oh, I'm sure the there's a, it's yeah. usually a jelly or a jam because I yeah it, yeah like, as like um I always forget the word for it. like it it likes to do like the solidifying into that it has like its natural pectins do it mm, mm. Tight, so I think it must like that format so maybe it needs to be a filling for like pastries or like toaster and did you say items. is it National Pawpaw Day then is it that is. the whole re okay. I don't, is, I, you it is National Paw Paw Day. It's also Yay. several other days, um, but that was the one that seemed most relevant to, to today. <laughs> um, and then the thing I I moved this a little bit earlier, but I don't know. I just kind of want to give a shout out to this because it's um, it was in the New York Times. If you look up Sally Schmidt um, in the New York Times, it was just posted a couple days ago. But she is actually the person who started the French Laundry. So she took an actual French Laundry, you know, in Yonkville, California, and turned it into a restaurant with her family. And uh, she's actually the one that kind of, you know, started that, you know, where people knew about the French Laundry. They got, you know, kind of all this attention for it. And then she sold it to Thomas Keller and, you know, Thomas Keller took it to where it is today. And I think, you know, it's, she's kind of been overshadowed a little bit. Sadly, she, she passed away um, recently. And, you know, that's kind of why they're highlighting her. But they have a video of her and she just seems like an absolutely, or seemed like an absolutely amazing person. And it's 20 minutes. I think it's well worth your time um really good video that the new york times did if you don't know that history of the french laundry i think it's definitely worth it and then jack started this i think on the last webinar where we were going to highlight an interesting restaurant we had either been to or just a restaurant that had opened across the country and we both have restaurants we had been to recently that we thought were interesting and this is so i was in san antonio this weekend and this is the plate that we got from a pizza place called Doe Napolitana. So it's ne Neapolitan style pizza. Um, and, you know, before we went in, like, to be honest, you know, as we went into the restaurant, the person I was with, we were talking about how, and I apologize if anybody on here is a burrata manufacturer or has burrata on the menu, but then we were getting tired of burrata and it felt like burrata was on everything. and We didn't need to see any more burrata. And then we walked in and immediately the first thing that they put in front of us was this, you know, tasting plate of burrata. But I, I 
you know, it goes to show that, you know, we shouldn't have preconceived notions about things because one, it was absolutely delicious. We were like, this really is like, if you're going to do burrata, this is burrata done right. They do it in-house. They've been doing, I think the, the concept itself has been around for something like 15 years now. And so they were well ahead of the burrata trend. Um, and you can see here, so at the top of the plate there, it's on top of some um, local seasonal watermelon. On the left there, they do kind of a take on the Italian flag with the three colors. And then on the right, there's a truffle burrata. And they were absolutely fantastic. The concept itself is great. They're super passionate about Italian cuisine and flavors. And if you're in San Antonio, I really highly recommend this place, um, Do Napolitano. Say. And then my pictures um, should not come after Mike's pictures because I just take them very quickly on a girl's <laughs> night. You can tell. Um, but for um, this, we did a Bocaria, which is not like a new trendy like place, but it's a rapidly growing chain. Like it's had many locations in New York and in Washington, D.C. And then Chicago got one two or three years ago, which I never bothered going to because my heart belonged to Cafe Abirico. Mm -hmm. Cafe Abirico was um, a closure from COVID. And so I needed to find oh, a I didn't even know that. I know it's uh -huh. not even updated on their website. You have to like go digging deep for this information. So we tried to pick a new place because we've always done tapas. Um, and it, it actually was really good. We went to Bogaria. Um, that has a Chicago location now in um, the Fulton district uh, on that street. And then they just opened one in Nashville, which I feel like is why, like it's sort of a surprising place to be the next after DC, New York. Now it's Nashville. <laughs> um, so it's definitely growing pretty quickly. And we did their um, classic experience where they just bring you food over and over, which is my favorite when you just tell them like, bring me everything. Um, <laughs> and I forgot to take pictures of the first three courses. It was that good. <laughs> and then their gimmick, um, the churros are a fun gimmick. They, uh, this one, they, I guess they always have them with sparklers. So they have like a churro Sunday where they like shape them and they come out with this silly like sparkler just to like end it on a celebration note. So we enjoyed that. Ah. And the next, I think we kept the next picture. Um, the decor was really, really nice. I'm not usually, when my area of expertise is definitely the food trends, less the decor. <laughs> Uh, but when I came in, this is kind of like a standard, this may not even be the, the view that I walked in on, but it has such like a classic tapas bar look. Like if anyone has actually gone to Spain and done the tapas thing, I studied abroad in, in the South of Spain and Granada, which is like where tapas is a pretty big thing. And it reminded me very instantly of like all of those actual places. So um, this is the Bocaria chain um, with opening one in Nashville. I agree. Yeah, we went there a couple months ago and had a similar fantastic experience. Like we weren't sure. It was like, I think it was like a 97 degree day and we were super hot. And we were just like, let's go have gin and tonics and, you know, get, you know, refreshed. And no, it was really, really, we had an really awesome nice experience. The octopus was fantastic. We didn't get the octopus, which I was sad. Uh -huh. but. <laughs> next time, next time. <laughs> uh, so at top of the hour, and we're actually we're running a little behind now, but um, so you probably noticed Jack is not here today. He is traveling. So you get myself um, and Mike Castillo, the trendologist at Data Central, and then Claire Conahan, and we are both on the content team together. And so uh, the thing that we always have to start with, if you would change this setting in your Zoom, um, in the chat box, change it to all panelists and attendees if you still get this option. Um, if you, you know, um, kind of come in just off the get-go, a lot of times you're just speaking to myself and Claire. So um, change it to all panelists and attendees, and you can chat with all of us and do chat with all of us. I think that's always our favorite part of these webinars. Um, as always, talking about some of the content that we have uploaded into Report Pro, which is our smart content library here at Data Central. Uh, I think the number one thing, you know, the number one download from the past month, the thing that we've all been so reliant on when it comes to pulling data is that one table report. So it's a, a massive report um, that just looks at, you know, what's really important to operators in the industry right now. Um, I know we did some of the data from it on a previous webinar. If you want to see that webinar, we have it. Um, we have the deck actually in Report Pro. And then um, under that deck, you can actually see the link to the actual YouTube recording. If you missed this, I think was this yesterday or the day before? I think this was Tuesday. Day before. Day before. Yeah, if you missed this, this was the adult wet beverage webinar that um, Colleen, Kyle, 
and Kelly did. Um, and again, absolutely fantastic. Um, again, here you can see this is the actual deck from it. And then we have that YouTube link there. But if, you know, alcoholic beverages or even non-alcoholic beverages are of interest to you because so many of those flavors make the leap from alcoholic to non-alcoholic, uh, this is well worth your time. This is, we've done one before and this is the second one. Um, and they're always, I mean, that's a space that moves so fast. The trends going on there are always so interesting to see. Um, and we also have uh, a new round of SIP reports. So uh, the SIP reports are a series of reports that look at particular alcoholic beverage categories. So we have them on kind of all of the main categories. You can see the hard cider one here. We have rosé, white wine, beer. Um, and it just kind of dives into that particular category, all of that top level data that you need. So what are consumers drinking? How often do they drink it? Um, what do they like? What do they dislike? What are the flavors they're looking for? Um, you know, if the, uh, particular alcoholic beverage category is uh, important to your business, um, I would say, you know, definitely jump into Report Pro and download these. This is uh, Jacqueline on our team produced this. This is the latest issue of Creative Concepts. And it looks at some of those next generation barbecue restaurants across the country. Really interesting stuff going on. The number of barbecue operators that are incorporating global flavors, particularly Asian and Latin flavors, it's just really interesting. And if you work in the protein space, there's a really cool double page spread that Jacqueline put together. That's all the different variations on regional barbecue and how they scored with consumers. So you can kind of see how those regional barbecues, um, you know, would do in front of a consumer base. And then this first section is always the section where I just run through some of the you know cool news and interesting um, launches um, on both the food service and CPG side. So I think a couple of those you, these you will have seen, but it's a, you know just kind of a good way for all of us in the industry to keep tabs on what's happening in the industry. This is probably the one that I think most people saw because it really you know was all over the news. I think the Today Show covered it. But um, this was the, it's a Swiss company called Migros, and they just um, it's I think four or five years in development, but they um, announced that they're going to launch this podless coffee system. So it's kind of like, you know, a Keurig system or something like that, but there's no actual, um, you know, plastic around it or metal around the pot itself. It has an algae um, kind of wrapper around it, and that allows it to be composted. So I know, you know, a lot of the arguments against some of those pod systems are the waste that's produced. And so um, this Swiss company is hoping that, you know, uh, this new system is going to, to kind of replace some of that. So I think it's going to be hard. I, you know, Keurigs are everywhere. Yeah, in my hotel room this weekend was a Keurig machine, but, but we'll see what happens. Uh, this, I had to put this in here because, so I posted this on my LinkedIn. And if you don't follow me on LinkedIn, I would encourage you to follow me on LinkedIn. I usually post like an interesting stat from Data Central every day. But I posted this. This was a, an article that came out in Fast Company talking about cheap swag at conferences and hopefully post-COVID how, you know, swag dies off. And it really spoke to me because I've been doing some fall cleaning in my condo and the number of mugs and disposable bags that I got rid of because, you know, I get them from conferences. I want to say I had something like 40 or 50 bags. And so I posted this on LinkedIn and the, the chatter that was happening and actually got picked up on that news um, kind of channel on the side of LinkedIn, people got really passionate about this topic. I'd be interested to hear in the chat if there's any swag that people have gotten from conferences that they really liked and, and that they actually use all the time. I think the hard part is even the swag that I like and that I use all the time. So, and there are some, like I, all my thermometers are swag from conferences. My aprons are swag from conferences. But once you have those things, you don't necessarily need them again. Um, and so, so there's a company that's actually mentioned in the article that allows people to choose their swag at the end of the conference, which I think is an interesting idea. But um, I, I don't know, is there anything that people are saying in the chat, Claire, that people really do like from conferences? Um, so far, no. People do. Some like the reusable shopping bags, always taking a portable charger. Um, mm. Someone referenced our, one of the chargers we gave out. So that was nice. <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> and then a, a tape measure keychain, which is a really good idea. <laughs> Well, that's a good idea. That's clever. I think too, I like, I appreciate food. Like if I get to a conference and there's food waiting for me in the hotel room, it means I don't have to like run to Target and get some snacks for the hotel room. So that's always a good option. And then there's, I know in the last webinar, we talked a little bit about AI because we actually took 
a concept that was developed in a breakout session at the Flavor Experience Conference, and we put it through the DALI AI engine to create an actual image of it. So we were talking a little bit about how you know AI technology can really revolutionize our industry. And then right after we talked about that, this news article came out which this is, a, there's an artist, he's a Colorado artist, his name is Jason Allen, and he submitted this digital um, image to the Colorado State Fair, and it actually won first place in the digital category. And then after the fact, it came out that he had actually used an AI engine called Mid Journey to create this image. And so there was, you know, a lot of arguments, um, definitely people who are, you know, other artists in that competition were not thrilled about it. But there was a lot of arguing online about whether this is legitimate, whether he should have won. Um, it is a really cool image. I think it really is, you know, kind of neat looking. Um, but I think there's going to be, we actually have a section in our 2023 trend report about kind of, you know, looking at AI and what consumers think. And um, I think this has been kind of a really pivotal year for the technology. Um, food service news, getting into some of the, the new launches at food service operations across the country. So uh, it's great that you put, you know, the churros from Bocaria at the beginning of the hour because I mean, churros are just moving right through the menu adoption cycle. I think they're, I want to say they're in proliferation right now. And I don't think, you know, I, I wouldn't bet against them moving into ubiquity pretty quickly here. So Baskin Robbins, they launched, this was their, um, I don't, when I say this was the, the August flavor, this was their, their new churro flavor that actually has dulce de leche ribbons um, all throughout it. Um, so again, what, you know, we just keep seeing churros. I think Krispy Kreme a couple of weeks ago um, launched their churdos which are, you know, churro flavored donuts. And so I, if you don't have churro, if you, you know, you work in the sweet space and you don't have a churro flavor already, I think it's definitely something that you should be considering. Um, and, you know, you know, we just talked about Krispy Kreme. I think we're starting to see all of these kind of cookie concepts that take the donut concept, but then, you know, um, actually you'd offer up cookies. So this is a, a chain called Cookie Plug that just opened a new location in Las Vegas, but their goal now is to go national. And so you can see kind of looks like crumble cookies. Their thing is that their cookies are a lot larger and a lot thicker. So it's kind of these massive um, softer cookies, but we're seeing so many of these. So there's crumble, there's cookie plug. I know crumble even, um, they sued, there was two brands Dirty Dough and Crave that um, actually they felt looked too similar to Crumble. And so um, you probably have one of these near you. I know Gen Z absolutely loves um, Crumble at this point. So um, I don't know, I, this is gonna be, I think we're, this is kind of one of those things where we're seeing all of the brands try to um, kind of dominate the market really early. And then I think we're gonna see some shakeout um, in the future. And speaking of Crumble, Crumble um, launched their first savory cookie. So this was their everything bagel seasoned savory cookie and they have a, a little cream cheese swirl on top there. And it actually is their first fully savory cookie. So they did do a cornbread one previously, but that did have some sweetness. The The reviews were, were pretty interesting. I think, you know, you either have to go in on the, uh, the concept of a savory cookie. Do they do cookie. regular garlic? Is it regular garlic? Or is the, it I don't know. I, yeah, is there garlic? garlic on the, I don't know. No yeah. Uh, I didn't try black it. Black garlic, that it. sounds good. Uh, yeah, and, and the people who loved it, loved it. They loved the concept of it. Um, I don't know. Like, and it was also one of those things where because it was kind of polarizing, you saw a lot of people on social media wanting to try it so they can kind of weigh in on whether they thought it was good or not. They're, I mean, they, Crumble always does interesting flavors. You know, uh, they did a French toast one recently. That was actually their first square cookie. And then we're going to talk about mooncakes in a little bit, but they did um, some mooncake cookies actually as well. And then um, everything bagel, I mean, you know, chur if churro is growing, if everything bagel, I think on the savory side is, you know, the one that's growing as well. And so Burger King is testing some everything bagel topped buns in a couple of markets across the country. They're doing it on a Whopper, they're doing it on a chicken sandwich. And then of course it makes sense to do it on a breakfast sandwich. But I mean, at this, I don't know, do you know where everything bagel is on the map um, right now, Claire? It's got to be in proliferation, it moved right? It to proliferation last yeah. year. Yeah, I was gonna say. If it hasn't, it's got to be. I'm asking amazing. some yeah. questions. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I think these sound really good. I think um, this makes a ton of sense. 
And then Habit Burger, I think this is interesting. So the, this is a side dish option at Habit Burger that they just launched, which is roasted cauliflower. And it has a sweet roasted garlic aioli on top and then a little squeeze of lemon. And I just love this idea. You know, they wanted to have something on, uh, as a side option that wasn't fried, that felt a little bit healthier. Um, and I think, yeah, one, I absolutely love cauliflower. And two, you know, we're starting to see cauliflower as kind of that default healthy option, whether it's on appetizer menus or as side dishes, um, I would absolutely order this. And I think it's also just interesting, you know, what are the apple slices of adults going to be as the side dish option, you know, is it going to be cauliflower? And then Wingstop, we can't not talk a lot about Wingstop and the chicken sandwich launch. So you probably saw how phenomenally successful the, the chicken sandwich launch was for Wingstop. They sold um, a million sandwiches in six days. I, I think they sold, it was something like six weeks of product out in, um, in those six days. Or, or I have it right here. I don't want to get it wrong. It was um, four weeks of supply was sold out in six days. Some locations actually sold out their entire supply in two days. Um, so the chicken sandwich trend is still going strong. The real differentiator for Wingstop is that you can get the chicken sandwich in any of their 12 varieties of glazes and spices that they offer up for their wings. So uh, they said it was a, this is was actually a bigger day for them than Super Bowl Sunday for them. So it's a huge, huge launch. Uh, again, you know, the innovation has Happening. I think we're constantly like, you know, is the chicken sandwich trend dying out anytime soon? And then we see a launch like this and, and it is not. And um, uh, the entertainment side. So um, the, the guy, Robert Thompson, he's the one that started uh, the Punchbowl social chain across the country. He just announced, uh, just announced what's going to be his next concept that he's going to launch. And it's uh, a concept called Camp Pickle. And I don't know, a pickleball is, I don't know if anybody listening plays pickleball or if you play pickleball. I've never played pickleball. I don't even actually know. Really? Like, I, yeah, I've never played it before. Uh, but it is taking over. I mean, so he wants to have 10 of them by 2026. I think the first one is supposed to open in Alabama in 2024. You can see here, it's a massive complex. It's kind of themed after kind of, you know, camps and national parks from the, the 40s, which I think is a great concept. They're going to do um, like old Coleman coolers with drinks in them and things like that. Um, we've already seen there's that chicken and pickle chain. There's actually one in San Antonio that we saw this weekend. Um, there's one that just opened in Boston called PKL, that their menu is really interesting. And I think that's uh, still the key at all of these entertainment places as we come out of COVID and they come back is that the food is, if anything, even more important. I know um, they said that they think um, food is gonna be 80% of their, their sales at the Camp Pickle location. And then this, um, I pulled this specifically, one, because it's interesting, and two, because um, I want to plug uh, an issue that Renee and our team just produced um, here at Data Central. So this is a concept in Washington called Butter Me Up. They have a few locations, um, but their only full service location um, opened recently, and they noticed that one, their, their base was primarily um, female consumers, and that a uh, large percentage of them had dogs that were coming, but they are not a dog-friendly location. You can't bring your, your dog into the restaurant. And so they launched these um, canine cabanas outside the restaurant. And you can reserve a canine cabana for your pooch. It has, you know, a little bed for them and has some water there. And then they actually have a menu specifically for dogs at these locations. And so I was at uh, the Fed Summit earlier this week, and they produced restaurant design magazine and food service equipment and supplies. And one of the panels, they actually mentioned that, um, you know, one of the keys for opening new locations has been trying to get permits to make um, concepts pet friendly because consumers demand it so much. And so in Report Pro, uh, Renee actually produced an issue of Food Bites, which is um, completely free to anybody um, that logs into uh, to the Report Pro system on pet friendly concepts. And some of the, I don't have a pet, um, I love dogs, but uh, you know, I, I, it was just fascinating to see. There was one stat in there that a quarter, I want to say it's like a quarter of consumers said that they had tried a new food or beverage because they had seen that food or beverage in the pet food aisle 
and they wanted to try it themselves. So I think that's just an insane stat that's very telling about consumers today. And this is what every year I get so excited when the State Fair of Texas um, launches all of the new items that are gonna be at the State Fair. And so these are some of the new items that they launch. The dirty soda trend has made it down into the South. So, you know, I know it's big in the Midwest. You see it a lot in uh, Utah in particular, but they did a number of, you know, dirty sodas that have some type of, um, you know, cream or, or oat milk in it, um, but with a lot of flavors that make sense um, in Texas and in the South. Uh, pickle top pizzas, uh, we're seeing these everywhere. I think we're gonna cover these in Trend Watch next year. The really interesting the one though is this pickle here, which is the chamoy stuffed candy pickle. So they take a pickle, they wrap it in a fruit leather, so like a, a fruit by the foot or a leather wrap. They stuff it with gushers. So the gushers, you know, gummies that kids eat. And then they put chamoy on top of it and then tahini on top of that. So um, I can only imagine you know, the, the puckers that you see in consumers' faces when they try this. But then this was actually the winner. This was the winner at the Texas State Fair. And I think, you know, these are out there, but I think there are lessons for, you know, if you are somebody developing new products, these are some really cool items that, you know, I think could inspire um, new menu items or new retail products. But but this was the winner in the savory category at the State Fair of Texas, which is uh, a fried charcuterie board. So they took the flavors and ingredients that you see on a charcuterie board and they put it in a wonton. So there's mozzarella in there, salami, green apples. They toss it together with some um, olive oil and some balsamic vinegar, uh, Italian herbs, and then they stuff it into the wonton and they fry it. They put some goat cheese on top and there's a drizzle of hot honey, which I sure think sounds pretty good actually. That's really so, good. Yeah. And I think I want to say the way that you win that category is um, it's, um, you know, a, a people's choice award. So I think you, you have to be somewhat tasty to win that award. And then in retail news, so just, you know, a few of the launches that retail CPG that we've seen, uh, Cheetos Bolita. So this is uh, a product that is, was previously only found um, in Mexico, and now they're going to bring it to the U.S., which I think we're, we've been seeing a lot of, and we're going to continue to see, you know, things kind of um, come from Mexico and make it onto U.S. retail shops. But these are basically cheese balls in kind of a chili flavor, or chili con queso flavor. So you're going to see it on retail shelves here pretty soon. Um, and it's not only that we're seeing, you know, products that are, you know, in Mexico coming over to the U.S., but just flavors in general. Obviously, we just talked about chamoy. Um, you know, tahine has been such a big grower. Uh, Doritos recently did a tangy tamarind flavor, which I really wanted to try. It sold out online, but um, it sounded really interesting. So we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, speaking of Doritos, they launched these ketchup and mustard flavored Doritos. And I did, I, I bought the mustard ones. The ketchup ones sold out, which I think is interesting that those sold out before the mustard ones. The mustard ones are very delicious. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's that out there. We already have, you know, honey mustard flavored chips. The thing about it is it did have that kind of spicy Dijon it, flavor process. Yeah. spicy makes people like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it has that, like that wasabi clear out your sinuses kind of that aspect so to it. Good. But they were done really well. Like, I mean, I would buy them, you know, I, I don't think this is something that needs to exist just to kind of get people's attention. Now, this is something that exists just to get people's attention because I bought these as well. So this is Cinnamon Toast Crunch. They did a Cinefuego Toast Crunch, which is a spicy flavor profile as well. But it's kind of that cinnamon heat. So not necessarily, you know, the same heat that you get from peppers. And I bought this, it's spicy. I mean, legit spicy. Like I took it to a party. And most people couldn't eat them. They thought they were too spicy. Uh, it's almost to me like, um, you know, like Flamin' Hot Cheetos, but on the sweet side, you know, it's kind of like that challenge to eat that. I couldn't eat a whole bowl of them. It's definitely to me for snacking, which it is a resealable pouch. So it probably is designed for snacking. Uh, but if you can get your hands on them, they, they didn't shy away from the spicy flavor. And then more cereal. Oh, the amount of cereal, you know, moving into other categories. I know. Crumble did a, um, a Fruity Pebbles launch, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, along with uh, that um, Everything Bagel one that we talked about. But so General Mills, they announced that their trick cereal, they're going to uh, incorporate into a popcorn snack. So it has a fruity sweet glaze on the top of it, and then it has little tricks pieces in there as well. So um, I think this is going to be available at Sam's Club, if I'm uh, not incorrect. 
And then more serial news, this one, very interesting concept. And uh, Jacqueline and our team made the point that she's surprised this didn't exist before. But these are uh, Kellogg's new Insta Bowls. So, I, I mean, that is one of the difficult things. If you have cereal on the go, you can't necessarily, you know, carry a little flask of milk around with you. So, uh, so these are, it's actually a concept that has the cereal in there and then it has instant milk in there as well. So all you have to do is pour water on top and stir it up. And then you get, you know, that instant bowl of cereal to take on the go with you. Um, I'd love to try these. And then this one, this uh, probably resonates with, I know you know this category really well, Claire. But um, so this is, it, it's so interesting to see how far this category has come. The fact that this isn't even the first non-alcoholic retail shop um, in LA. They have a couple of them now. But this is one that just recently opened in July called The New Bar. And they specifically focus on those non-alcoholic um, you know, but spirit beverages, so wines, um, you know, spirits, things like that. And she said, uh, the person who started it, she said that actually her father, uh, she comes from a family where, uh, you know, drinking was the centerpiece of events and birthdays. And so, um, you know, uh, her father actually got sick and he couldn't drink anymore. And so she had to look for other ways to kind of incorporate drinks into those special occasions. And so she got to know the non-alcoholic side of the industry pretty well. And um, that has, you know, resulted in opening this store. Uh, one, I think it's a really beautiful store, but two, you can see how many options there are today. And the cool thing about it is if you walk in there, here's a little quiz for you because she knows it's a pretty, you know, new category that people haven't necessarily had the chance to try all these. And even if you know this category, you know, there's new ones popping up all the time. And so, um, you know, she does a little quiz so you can figure out, you know, which of the options that you might like. So if you're in LA, I would definitely suggest popping into this retail shop. And now we're going to move into the meat of the matter, which is fall trends and looking at, you know, some of the foods and flavors um, that we're seeing, you know, released on menus and on retail shelves this fall, you know, some of the foods and flavors that, um, you know, can absolutely inform innovation as you start to think about next fall. And so I'm going to cover some of the launches. Um, I would encourage you, yeah, you know, to write down any themes that you're seeing, you know, this um, presentation is going to live in Report Pro. So depending on when you do, you know, your fall innovation work, whether that that's immediately after fall ends or, you know, next spring, um, you know, this is going to exist in Report Pro. And then uh, Claire's going to get into some of the data around what we're seeing when it comes to foods and flavors. This is my favorite season. I'm, I can't wait for, for all of these fall flavors to hit menus. One of the interesting things that we're seeing, so I said earlier that, um, Crumble Cookies actually did some mooncakes on the menu. And we're seeing pretty much every major city has some operators doing mooncakes for the Mid-Autumn Festival. So if you don't know the Mid-Autumn Festival, it is um, you know, a traditionally Chinese festival, although there are pretty similar festivals that happen in Korea and Japan and Taiwan and uh, you know, countries in that region. Uh, but you celebrate it with mooncakes. And if you've ever been to, to China during the Mid-Autumn Festival, um, every you know, major restaurant chain, haagen Starbucks, as their own versions of mooncakes, a very elaborate, beautiful packaging. The lines are out the door. Um, and it is just such a cool, you know, food centric festival. And so we're seeing it kind of move over to the US. Um, so this is an operator called OMG Squee. And you might know the operator if you watch um, Queer Eye on Netflix. The, the um, woman who started this um, chain, she actually was on Queer Eye and they did a makeover for her and they did a makeover of the shop too, actually. But so this is her mid-autumn festival flavor menu. And so on the right-hand side here, you can see what her mooncakes look like, um, some really cute varieties there. And then on the left-hand side, you can see they do, do some mochi donuts um, that have some really unique flavors. So Salted egg yolk, I just love that flavor. I'm excited to see it, um, you know, showing up more often. And Ube Oreo being the customer favorite. Obviously, we've talked about Ube so much um, on so many of these um, webinars. This, if you want some cool, you know, weird out there Halloween innovation, look to the theme parks. They have really gotten serious about the food that they offer up at their various, you know, Halloween events. This comes from Universal Studios. They do their Halloween horror nights. Um, in Orlando and in Hollywood every year. And they have a, a portion of the park that's dedicated to kind of 
uh, this candy factory that you know turned all these kids into to little murderers, <laughs> like uh, so for Halloween. And so um, this is one of the offerings in that particular portion of the park, which is this a hundred percent fresh ground princess meat. <laughs> so it's actually a rice krispie treat that has a raspberry, a sweet raspberry sauce on it. Uh, but I think I mean this is obviously really out there, really creative packaging, um, really kind of fun stuff that they're doing. They also they, this is another app that they're doing. This is their, I think they call it like a maggot, maggot on a stick or um, maggot covered cheese dog. That's what they call it. And so it's a take on one of the Korean corn dogs that we've been seeing pop up all across the country. But their version has some um, crispy puffed rice on the outside of it to be those maggots. And then they do a gochujang glaze over the top and then some black and white uh, sesame seeds over it. So uh, a maggot corn dog at Universal Studios. If you want in your face stuff, look to Universal. If you want things that are a little bit more family friendly, look to what the Disney parks do. So this is at Disney World. Um, they do, um, I think this is in uh, Hollywood or um, in California, because I think that one does the Boogie Boogie um, themed event from Nightmare Before Christmas. And this is their Oogie Boogie nachos um, that has some of the Dole Whip that you find throughout the parks there. There's some gummy worms on there that you can see. And it's on some uh, sweet waffle cone chips there. So just kind of a clever take on, you know, a sweet um, nacho option. We talked a little bit um, on the webinar uh, in the summer when we were looking forward to what we were going to see on menus in the fall. We talked a little bit about what we thought we would see on menus. And I know one of the, the flavors that we called out was blood orange. You know, it just made sense to see a lot more blood orange on menus in the fall because we were so seeing so many fruit flavors being used in the cold drinks on fall menus since they do launch, you know, when it's still 80, 90 degrees out. And then a couple of weeks later, Duncan actually came out with, you know, their, um, the, this is their blood orange refresher on the right hand side here. So um, it does have blood orange and it. it has a little bit of cranberry too for tartness. Um, and I know you're going to talk a little bit about um, cranberry as well. But I think, you know, we're going to see particularly next year, even more blood orange launches. Duncan was kind of the main one to do it this year. Um, Starbucks again went kind of all in on Apple. And this year we saw, um, you know, I think last year we saw Starbucks and Duncan do Apple. This year we've seen so many brands doing Apple. So Starbucks did do their caramel apple macchiato again they changed it a little bit so now the default um dairy or alternative dairy in the drink is oat milk so instead of having traditional milk it's oat milk which is a theme that you see over and over again this year swapping out whatever the the dairy that they did use for an alternative um mostly being oat milk um I know we've saw, we saw so many launches when it comes to Apple this year. So Shake Shack did an apple cider donut shake. Wendy's, I wish we were in Canada because Wendy's did a caramel apple frosty, but you can only get it in, if you're in Canada. Um, Car, uh, Caribou did their boosted apple blast. So it has a lot of caffeine in that version. Pete's did a caramel apple latte and an apple cinnamon oat latte. So again, we saw a lot of oat milks. Um, I think the thing that we keep seeing over and over is kind of the big three are pumpkin, apple, and maple at this point you know if you're going to put three flavors on the menu it's probably those three uh, and then there are these kind of ancillary flavors that we see um, you know in addition to those big three and sometimes being incorporated into those big three so some of those flavors that we keep seeing are a lot of nutty flavors so sometimes um, a nutty flavor also um, kind of makes it into the top three on the menu pilot jade this is their southern pecan cold brew that they did um, this year you can see it iced here uh, I think last year they did a bourbon pecan so this year, um, it's a variation on that. We've seen a number of pecan launches this year. I'm going to talk about a CPG product launch um, that has pecan in them. Hazelnut is the other one. We tend to see a lot of hazelnut being launched in the fall. Um, this is Pete's Coffee. So another uh, trend that we continue to see is brown sugar. So, you know, if you traditionally you would use uh, regular white sugar, we're seeing a lot of swaps for brown sugar. It just gives you that richer flavor profile. If you take it to the next level, we often see people do molasses after that. But this is Pete's Coffee. This is their pumpkin cold brew oat latte. So again, more oat milk in here. But at the bottom, you can see there they do the brown sugar jelly. Um, so kind of their cake on boba there. And boba, another one that we continue to see, um, you know, in every season growing. Gen Z just cannot get enough boba. I think we're going to see it grow even more and move into some of those major national chain menus even more. Pilot Flying J also did uh, a brown sugar ice cream this year. Um, but I, the thing that I wanted to call out is 
So they actually did a pumpkin bread batter ice cream. So in Trendwatch, Renee and our team um, just reduced, produced a report in Report Pro called Trendwatch. And we did some of the doughs and batters that we're seeing in things, you know? So I, for a while we were seeing all the cookie dough flavored things. Now we see every dough and batter than you, that you can imagine, red velvet batter and things. And so this was an interesting one. We hadn't necessarily seen a chain do a pumpkin bread batter. So if you work in the dessert space and you haven't used, you know, whatever um, you know, items that you have in your product line as a batter or as a dough in other options, particularly like ice creams and things like that, you should definitely look to it. So they use it both in the ice cream itself and then they use it in this, um, this um, ice cream pie here. A brown sugar again, so Chick-fil-A, this was their first milkshake launch in four years, their first um, new milkshake launch in four years which they call their autumn spice one. So if you want to kind of free yourself up from having to do pumpkin and pumpkin spice, um, we've seen a few places call it autumn spice or using, you know, other kind of terminology to get away from the pumpkin. But so this is their autumn spice one. And actually they have brown sugar cookies that are um, all throughout it. So again, we're seeing that brown sugar in there. Uh, Dutch Brothers Coffee, I think this is an interesting launch. This is their sweater weather uh, chai white. We that sweater sweater weather term we saw in a lot of the marketing terminology that came out from chains, um, but it uses white espresso beans. So it's those espresso beans that aren't necessarily roasted to kind of that really dark flavor profile that we're used to in coffee, which means that it's also, it's not only, you know, kind of a little bit nuttier, but it also has more caffeine in it because the more you roast coffee, the more you kind of burn off some of that ca caffeine content. And so we're seeing, um, you know, quite a few options that have a higher caffeine content. There's actually, I wish I remembered the name of it. There's a bar in uh, Boston that just opened that has a coffee cocktail on the menu and they only allow you to have one because the caffeine content content is so high. Um, so um, Caribou also did that boosted apple option that has a high caffeine content. And then of course, you know, those are kind of the flavors we're seeing. So like I said, we're seeing a lot of pumpkin, apple, and maple as kind of the core flavors for the holiday. And then kind of the, the additional flavors we're seeing um, tend to be the nutty flavors, like the pecans and the hazelnuts, a lot of chai, um, some marshmallow on menus, and then brown sugar tends to be a big one as well. But then the other two things that we see a lot, of course, are the celebration of football season. And so this is Papa John's new lunch. This is their uh, football shaped pizza. So it's a pretty traditional pizza, but it is in the shape of a football. They don't cut it, interestingly. So you have to cut it yourself when it comes to you. But that's kind of an easy change that you can make is the shape of something. Obviously we see a lot of, um, you know, Valentine's pizza launches that are in the shape of a heart. If you wanna see a chain that does a really good job doing interesting pizzas, particularly for Halloween, actually, look at Pizza Express in the UK. They do some really, really unusual pizzas, um, the toppings and the shapes of zombies and, um, you know, Frankenstein's and things like that. Um, they also do some little dough bites that are in the shape of jack-o'-lanterns. They do a really good job um, for the fall season. On the retail side, uh, you know, at this point, you know, I think any of the brands that haven't launched the pumpkin product at this point, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of par for the course, we have to launch a pumpkin product. So we saw Goldfish, which has been doing so much uh, flavor innovation. We saw the Old Bay flavored Goldfish. Previously, uh, they worked with Duncan for these pumpkin spice graham. So it's, uh, you know, not just the flavor of pumpkin spice, but specifically pumpkin spice donuts. So it has that glaze on top of those. And you tried these, right? You had these. Yeah, I have them in my pantry right now. Okay. <laughs> good. Do they do a good job? I, I think so. I mean, they taste, they have that like really unique flavor where it's not like, yeah, that like, it's just pumpkin spicy, but not pumpkin <laughs> at all somehow. It feels like it almost reminds me a little bit of like Teddy Graham's but pumpkin flavor. They're they're very, very much like a okay. dialed up version. <laughs> and then, and I am going fast. I know there's so much time, but uh, Claire has amazing data. I want to make sure that we get to. Uh, but so, again, Duncan doing some great innovation for the fall. They've been doing their collaboration with Harpoon Brewery for years now, uh, but this is their newest iteration. So the Duncan Pumpkin. Um, is the thing that they come out with every single year. Although they did change it up again this year. And again, the change is that it's oat milk um, actually used in that beer there. But then the other three are all new options. I think the most interesting one, so again, we said hazelnut being that nutty version. 
um, is the coffee roll. And it actually uses Duncan coffee roll to produce the beer itself. And we're seeing this, so, you know, I, at this point, if you're a brand that hasn't produced a beer option, uh, you know, I think you're probably looking at it in the future. I know Hardy's did a biscuit beer with um, a brewer, I think out of Tennessee, where they actually used 200 pounds of their biscuits for the beer. And then you mentioned the, the Garrett's popcorn. Yeah, there's both Garrett's here. popcorn doing one. And then there's um, an, like an Annie Ann's pretzel situation. That makes sense. That For Oktoberfest, that would be amazing. Yeah, both of them. They're both. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, really. Yeah. When Garrett's, yeah. If you come through Chicago, you know you have to get Garrett's. Um, Spindrift, so another apple variety. This is their first seasonal offering. So the first limited time seasonal launch that they've done. And it is apple or apple cider that they did both in their spiked version and um, in their traditional um, sparkling water version there. And then, like I said, you know, mentioning some of the, the nutty flavors that we're also seeing in fall product launches, um, we see again, you know, RX Bar bringing the pecan flavor back. So pecan and hazelnut, again, being those two biggest options. So I'll turn it over to you. I mean, I think here we see a lot of the things that we just talked about reflected in the data. Yeah, it's always nice when data actually works with real life, which happens <laughs> lots in our lives, and it was nice to see. Um, this is something anyone who was here for the mid-year trends uh, saw us cover already, uh, but as a recap, since we tend to fly through it, what we thought would be fun to do is we talk a lot about fall trends, but I've I've never, I, I've done a lot of seasonal work here, um, split things up by month very much. So that's what I played with for the next couple of slides. So you can see what peaks um, in general, but sometimes it's intuitive, like probably eggnog was skewing to November, but when you look um, like at fall in general, it doesn't always show the eggnog um, peaks because over the, the three months, it ends up being that eggnog might skew more towards winter. But if you actually look on a month by month basis, you start to see different things and you're starting to see what we've been talking about, which is, you know, pumpkin is showing up in August. So <laughs> therefore, obviously, eggnog, gingerbread and peppermint must therefore start showing up in November and the data supported that. Um, chocolate pecan actually um, hits in November. And then for September, we see all, all those warming spices. And then Granny Smith apple actually showed up in the sweet realm, um, as well as in the savory realm. So some of the examples cross over um, both of those. So we looked into seeing, uh, let's pull out one and talk a little bit more about the stats. So dates, I really liked. You were talking, Mike, about brown sugar. Then you do molasses. We could do maple. What else could we sweeten with? And this is, of course, one that people usually think of as just being a healthier, um, kind of more whole food way of sweetening, but it also has that really unique kind of um, caramel flavor to it. So why not, instead of just using it as a sweetener, try to lean into the flavor of it. So um, dates, not they didn't have the highest stats, but when you look at people who have actually bothered to try them, people love them. So like they mm. love the actual dates themselves and the flavor profile. Um, so then I pulled out a couple examples from scores and you can see the scores and these things that call out dates. Um, first off, these are items from scores where we're testing these items with consumers, the new items and limited time offers. And you can see that those composite scores are pretty high, all things considered, um, especially this harvest salad. Um, that's a, you know, it's competing against a lot of things, but to have a 49% of consumers saying they would probably or definitely buy a salad <laughs> is a pretty exciting thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they release it at least for the past two years. Um, so that has the date and fig vinaigrette. Fleming's also does the sticky date pudding um, each September. Um, they've done it at least for the past two years. I can't see a reason to not do it again this year. Um, that one being interesting. Um, so it's the sticky date, but then they also add a honeycomb brittle. Ooh. And then this pumpkin delight smoothie from Smoothie King is a uh, several year standby. Um, they describe it a little bit differently each year and some iterations score a little higher than others based on those descriptions. Um, this was the one I picked because it did the best. Um, it leaned a little bit into the healthy, but not all the way. The ones that leaned all the way into healthy did not do as well. And the ones that kind of buried that there was a health aspect to using um, the dates uh, didn't do as well. So this one um, using it both as flavor and sweetener. And then Freshy introduced these pumpkin spice bites last year and it did pretty well as a snack. I don't know if they'll bring them back um, this year yet. I couldn't find that they had, but maybe someone else um, sees differently. Uh -huh. Uh, and then also for November, we, we decided to look at cranberries. And I know you're thinking, well, of course, cranberries <laughs> are a seasonal fall flavor. Of course, that's obvious. But I feel like there's just like one iteration of them. People love them. 60% of consumers love or like them. And then if we look at our examples, 
Um, I feel like the classic is you assume it's being used in that classic turkey sandwich that many chains release in uh, November so that you can have it not just the day after Thanksgiving or if you didn't host and there wasn't enough turkey left over, you can get <laughs> your fix on that in other locations. But there's actually a ton of applications for it. So you could do cranberry pancakes like I hopped did. Um, you can use the cranberry as a flavor. I picked this one because the others are usually with berries. This leans into kind of that indulgent smoothie space with white chocolate. Um, and then the bourbon apple highball, uh, it's funny because like the cranberry is not the key flavor. It's not the call out in the title of it, but you can see it in the description. So they're leading with that classic fall apple that everyone's doing, uh, but cranberry is still an important component in it. So interesting. I think too, uh, cranberries add so much, not just in flavor, that tart flavor, but the color. I mean, uh, this is such a beautiful they're color. They're so pretty. Color, but, yeah. Uh, and then this is, again, a recap. We're looking now at savory. So this is what we covered on the last one. Um, you can see how different things start to show up. Um, and we have fall and winter here. Uh, and then we wanted to do the same thing. Let's look at each month and actually see what's popping up there. Uh, so we did savory flavors. Um, of course, we have Granny Smith apple again. Um, and then also <laughs> all of the mustard, beer cheese, Oktoberfest stuff happening in September, which is when Oktoberfest should in fact occur. Do not be confused. <laughs> and then October is just kind of creamy. Kind of, they seem sort of random, all things considered. I, I didn't pull any examples from that. Um, they do index higher, um, but it just so happens it's the types of dishes that are featured at that time. And then mm -hmm. November, we've got your classic cranberry again, both in relish and sauce form, turkey gravy, of course, mushroom sauces, um, though that's a little bit, those are older examples. We went as far back as 2016. Those are more older and paired with seafood, oddly enough, and then mm -hmm. apple butter. Yeah. It is funny to see the ones that, yeah, you know, are both on the sweet and savory side of the menu, like the apples and cranberries um, to cross utilize. Uh, and then we've got um, beer cheese, of course, is a good mm. one to call up because it's still growing super rapidly. <laughs> and why not um, discuss uh, what's happening with beer cheese? Because you can do a lot with it. It's a flavor, sauce, cheese, whatever you want it to be. You can make it happen. Uh, so the <laughs> scores examples support uh, that people like it a fair amount, um, though I was sort of surprised that a jumbo Bavarian pretzel has that low of a composite. Yeah. I guess it's just not that unique. It's a pretzel. What's not to like? Um, it has a horseradish, it maybe, people. maybe horseradish mustard. Mm. Um, maybe mm. it just, I don't know. Um, but that one only <laughs> does okay, which sort of surprised me. And then the others um, are, you know, sandwich or um, fries, uh, putting beer cheese on top. Those are kind of classic applications that obviously have high appeal. Uh, savory dishes. Uh, this one I felt like calling out beef stroganoff because there's not enough times where beef stroganoff pops in data. <laughs> it just doesn't <laughs> often. So that's why I picked a pretty, pretty picture for it here. Uh, and then for November, there's some fun ones, and we will talk about tamales shortly because that one I was like, is that really, really? And of course, it makes <laughs> sense when you think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got tamales. Uh, the instinct, uh, I wanted to look at 50% of consumers uh, love or like them. That almost seems too high, but no, that, that is correct. It's not of those that have tried them. It is in fact the correct number. I like want to double check it, but that's it. <laughs> um, and then the reason, yes, it is all um, kind of Mexican style chains, but it's not just one doing it. It's not like somebody who always, and then you think a little bit more. It's a celebratory food in mm -hmm. Mexico. Of course, it would start to peak in November when you start to get towards the holidays. Um, and then you also have, it's kind of a take on it. You'll sometimes see it more independence um, where they'll do the Navidad style where it has the green sauce and the red sauce. You can see that take on it from Del Taco. People clearly, maybe if you marketed it more like that or introduced it in December, it would have a higher composite score. Uh, but you can see like there are some applications um, from here where it would make sense. And then we even have the pumpkin pie dessert tamales. So they're like leaning into that fall in sort of a, a interesting way. It's an older example, but there's still lots you could do with it. Um, I feel like, and as far as almost like a flavor or ingredient or a bowl dish, I think there's more that could be done with tamales. I also happen to really love them. They're like my mom's favorite food, but thoughts to ponder. Agreed, yeah. And I remember Renee mentioned on a webinar sometime back 
There was the tamale retail product. That was actually a shelf stable tamale product. Um, that I wonder how it's doing and if it's still around. And I also wonder the pumpkin pie dessert tamales, if you tested it now, if you know. Yeah, like if you bring it back, yeah. would it work? When are we yeah. just under thinking, like, because there's like the Chicago style tamale where we do horrible things to the original tamale <laughs> and make it a different type of delicious. And it's like a steamed, um, like hot dog style product. So there's, there's surprising possibilities. Yeah. I love these. Um, we did the same. I, I copied off of Mike's mid-year trip because I thought it was super fun. Uh, so we did fall LTO winners. I looked the past two falls. So this is 2020 and 2021. And we did the same thing that Mike did for the mid-year trends. So our superstar uh, is this red velvet hot cocoa. There's actually a couple items that had a 99 composite score, uh, but this is the one that did the best on both purchase intent and uniqueness. So it ended up the winner. Uh, and I think it is sort of funny that in none of the data did red velvet actually pop as a seasonal and maybe that's uh -huh. your favorite all year. Um, but with like the color and the coziness, we saw your crumble example, um, not the crumble, the other, um, the crumble cookie people that are not crumble what was the other brand oh they the, like a cookie plug velvet. They uh -huh. had a purple velvet so i think that if you did like purple velvet or you would see like mm -hmm. black velvet for halloween like that really dark yes. black cocoa um possibilities here oh, i love that i don't yeah i mean the color of this is just real i'm not a huge red velvet person but the color of this is oh, really between the beautiful. color and like people yeah. just like the sweeter chocolate what's yeah. that like if that's your style <laughs> And that's the thing, I, and all the, you know, pulling all the examples, the thing that came up just in the marketing is just marketing that sweater weather, sweater weather, coziness, you know, like that's what comes up over and over. So I can just imagine, yeah, like the imagery of a uh, consumer holding that um, in their hand. And then the highest purchase intent was this side lovers meal, which I guess speaks to the power of sides. It's like the <laughs> classic KFC meal, but with even bigger um, side situations. It's now a, a permanent menu item and they'll often promote it for holidays, but that was the top purchase intent item. Yeah, I guess yeah. the power of that pretty picture of mac and cheese and mashed <laughs> potatoes, it just does it. That's awesome. I um, love this. <laughs> this one, I had to look the first like 10 or so by purchase intent are actually kids items uh, because it's not, um, it's a subset of consumers. You have to be someone with kids to assess if you're, you would buy something for your kids. That makes sense. Um, so the top item for um, purchase intent, if you look, if you allow kids items to show up is this Mr. Mummy pancake, which is a reminder that it doesn't have to be a new flavor. It can just be something silly that you dyed green. And like, it'll probably <laughs> still sell. <laughs> like, that's okay. <laughs> and that can be fun too. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is what we're talking about with those things we see at the theme parks. This is what we're talking about when it comes to that football shaped pizza. I mean, the Halloween of any holiday is one where I think you can have some fun with, you know, some, and that's when you see those high uniqueness scores, but also high purchase intent scores. And it's not necessarily like, you know, so out there for the consumer. It just makes it a little bit stand out a little bit more. Uh, and then our top uniqueness item was this like very limited time offer. Um, I think it was from 2020. So it's not, it wasn't even done the, the prior year, but this was only in Times Square. You could get this very expensive, but very cool <laughs> donut with like the, the shellac glaze um, and, the, and the filling. And it came in this fancy box. And I'm sure it was a very exciting uh, Instagram moment for some folks at that time. Yeah, this is fancy. I mean, this looks like, you know, those really high end pastries that you see in the, the really fancy pastry shop. Yeah, so it makes sense that in our data where we have just, you know, regular things, this super limited time offer of only being sold until it was sell, sold out or just for a short period of time in one place would be. And Krispy Kreme is like a perennial uniqueness winner. I remember, I think, not last year, but the year before, but I think the most unique item in scores was they did that Mars donut for the launch of one of the rockets or satellites, and it had kind of that, you know, Martian look to it, and that was the highest uniqueness, so Krispy Kreme does a good job in that area. Um, and then frequency, we were laughing at this. You mean, again, <laughs> we see just like we did in the mid-year trend report, shrimp, which is so funny. It's not like the top protein when you just mm -hmm. look at flavor. Like people like it. It's like a top seafood, but it's not. And then this one is even more surprising because it's wicked shrimp. So it's spicy. Mm -hmm. But I guess for those folks that want it, they would go there all the time for it. So this was the, the top fall frequency and not exactly fall themed. So interesting. Yeah, we were talking about it. I, we've talked about it a few times, I know. But post-COVID, we, we were talking about it at the conference this week. The consumer demand for seafood because they weren't making it at home. Like, as so many of the chains are still seeing it. 
Um, and then this is why on the beer two slide, you did not see the classic launch from Wendy's of their pretzel bun beer cheese situation that they do um, in the fall is because I wanted to save it for this draw moment, of this <laughs> top draw item. And again, we see the uh, chicken sandwich. Um, it's just, you know, top, top draw. I mean, who would do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the thing about the beer cheese too, is that we are, we're seeing so many places either using their own beers or using the, you know, next trendy beer variety in that beer cheese. So it's an easy platform to take trendy beer, beer flavors and turn it into a cool thing. Oops, I think I went the wrong direction. I was going like, did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we did, we didn't do um, value again. I did just show 99 cent things yet again. Um, so in this case, we looked at, um, as Mike did, he did delivery interest in the mid-year trend. So I looked at the delivery interest and it was a pizza. It's always, almost always a pizza because pizza is a great delivery food. Yep. <laughs> in this case, it was the double cheeseburger pizza, which was fun because today is also double cheeseburger day. So it's an October, yeah, for real. Um, it's supposed to be, it's an October LTO. Uh, and I think maybe it should be a September LTO if they're not making yeah. it. Time. <laughs> yeah, I remember when we did this for mid-year trends, I was, you know, pulling delivery interest. And what, what did I, it was like the top 12 of the 15 the, of that rated the highest in delivery were all pizza options. And who was it? Is it Domino's or I, I feel bad if I'm getting this wrong, but I want to say it's Domino's just launched the uh, the burger line, I want to say in Australia. And they're really interesting. Like, um, I, we were talking about it on the trend spotting team. Uh, and then for our drive through interest, uh, there was another item um, that was actually higher up, but it had no, um, it was definitely not fall themed in any shape or form. And I think it was, it would, it would have been a top value item too. It's like a $3 snack box and it mm. says $3 in the name. So it's not really giving us, it's both value and um, kind of skewing uh, who's interested because we already know it's drive through. I think that was the top item. In any case, the sweet potato fries kind of fall themed. Um, it's an item that they've launched at varying moments. Um, but it seemed to have the highest, at least for drive-through interest and kind of overall composite scores. It did better as a fall item and ended up being the top for drive-through interest because- That's interesting. I wonder if people like it so much in the drive-through. I feel like fries are the thing that you can dip into the like, bag. I think before there you is get... something. Yeah, different. yeah. It's like the thing that when you're trying to wait to bring your food home to your family or whoever else, you <laughs> yeah. keep grabbing those until it's, um, you don't have to wait to a safe moment while driving. <laughs> And I don't think anybody would be surprised by this on the call today, but I was at that conference, which was predominantly people who build out restaurants or design restaurants um, earlier this week. And the drive throughs are not going away anytime soon. You know, that is definitely for all the next generation build. It's all, you know, two and three drive through stations. Uh, and then this is the dine-in interest. I believe the top one was actually a steak and egg breakfast dish. Um, and mm. steak and eggs actually indexed highly for fall, but driven by one chain. It was Black Bear Dine does like a line so that makes sense um I wasn't necessarily fall themed so I skipped to the next one and because it's you know soup season and we haven't discussed soup yet um so cheddar ale soup uh we've got it doesn't call out necessarily um what ale but it's still mm -hmm. you know it's got that it's definitely a dine-in food like you cannot you are not sneaking soup <laughs> as you go through the drive through it's not going to work out for you um so this is one that um had the highest dine-in interest and I think um it would be a really easy way um probably operationally to just keep like if you want to have something fall themed like a cheddar ale soup that you you pre-purchased is going to um keep well and be pretty easy to integrate into a couple dishes and I think we've seen a couple places try like the soup cups and drinkable soups. I mean, obviously Campbell has like the soup on the go, but we've seen a couple places tried in food service, but I don't think we've ever really seen a takeoff yet. I'm not. People I'm consider not soup. Do, I've seen, have you ever seen like where they do like tomato soup for the cheese curds? That is. Um, oh yeah. When I was going to, anything brothy, I feel like makes a little bit more sense than to go for my, did, I don't know if I want to like drink like really it's thick, a good like it could be soup. so that's like yeah. operation it could be a side to like a dipper to a condiment if you will yeah really so, um, we wanted <laughs> to make you... sure... oh sorry go ahead 
Oh, no, go ahead. I don't uh, Queue it up, absolutely. Okay. I would say we wanted to make sure that we uh, uh, let everyone know to clear their calendars for this. If they're um, not planning to join, they absolutely must because it's one of the best ones of the year. Uh, it will be Jack and Sean bringing us state of the menu. Um, and Jack informed me that we will be covering these things. Um, and somewhere he is very upset if he is watching or not uh, that I chose <laughs> to just put them in this bulleted form for you. But this way you can see them as we quickly close out. He's like, this is what you chose to do to promote it. Um, <laughs> I did this whole other thing where I took screenshots from last year's and I was like, this also looks weird, but it's going to talk about where menus are headed, um, how the post-COVID recovery on menus looks, uh, and has a peek at our latest menu inflation stats. Um, Jack has been spamming um, and like having conversations in our company Slack about all these different cool price point things. So there's going to be some really cool slides on that um, and more. I mean, yeah, I really like can't reiterate and like I, even internally. We get so excited for this data. We use it all the time. And uh, there's so many changes that have happened. You know, we did this last year and everything was all, you know, COVID, COVID, COVID. This is what happened to menus. So I think this year will be so interesting to see what happened, um, you know, as we kind of come out of it. I know we say all the time you can't miss it, but this truly is an unmissable. So this one I really, really, uh, it's my most downloaded. It, like I constantly re-download State of the Menu and the Mid-Year Trends, like over and over. Yep. I'm constantly re-downloading. <laughs> Agreed. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. So this is our email. If you have any questions, if you need access to Reports Pro, if you have any questions about some of the reports that we talked about, you know, shoot us an email at hello at datacentral.com. And we are happy to answer any questions that you have. And I think we are ending one minute early.